Good morning. Uh, so good morning all and welcome uh, to today's webinar. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Nick Lane. I'm the Deputy CEO at the AAA and I'll be providing a brief introduction to today's webinar. Um, for te technical assistance, please phone Redback Support on 1800 733 416. Um, if you'd like to listen to this webinar through the phone instead, please dial uh, the number and passcode shown in the chat box. Uh, today, um, the AAA presents its fourth uh, webinar, and uh, the topic today is Aerodrome Safeguarding Fundamentals of Airspace Protection, and will be pre presented by Keith Tonkin. Keith is the Managing Director and Principal Consultant of Aviation Projects. Um, Keith has, uh, has spent um, over 30 years in the aviation industry, starting out as a pilot first in the military, and then for uh, an Australian airline. Um, Today's uh, webinar, in today's webinar, Keith will present the fundamentals of airspace protection now and in the future. Um, to ask Keith a question, please use the chat box which is located on the left hand side of your screen, um, just to the right of the cog wheel. Um, after typing out your question, hit enter to submit. Questions will be answered throughout the webinar. Um, uh, before we do start, I would like to take the opportunity to firstly um, uh, to, thank, um, to, to thank Keith for his participation today um, uh, and, uh, and we really do appreciate your um, participation in this particular platform and uh, we're excited about our webinar program. So uh, thank you again, Keith. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Keith to begin today's webinar. Thank you, Keith. Thanks, Nick, and uh, welcome everyone to our webinar. Of just reflecting on airspace protection with Nick having flown back from Surabaya last night through Bali and thinking about um, trying to race through that airport before the volcano erupted and you know, I reflected on how do you protect your airspace from volcanic ash, it's a bit hard. So what we're going to try and do today is talk about some of the things that we can do at our local level to uh, protect the airspace that we need for aircraft to operate safely. Uh, in and around our airports in Australia specifically and it's aimed at a relatively low level as a basic fundamental understanding of how airspace protection works. Before we go any further though, I've just got a quick question to ask about who's viewing the webinar and what role you play in aerodrome safeguarding. So if you could answer that poll for us please. So what I'm seeing there is um, nearly a third are airport managers, about 20% uh, are airport planners, consultants making up 30%, uh, some legal fraternity and interested parties. That's interesting, thanks very much everyone for that one. So today the scope of this presentation is to establish the need for operational airspace, uh, talk about what the types are, um, what can go wrong so that we understand the importance of uh, managing uh, the intrusion of things, whatever they might be, into the airspace you need. We'll talk about basic design parameters, uh, go through how to do that at a very basic level, uh, how to protect your airspace and then just some complications for thought later on. So, what is operational airspace? And that's, this is a term, it's very Queensland centric I have to admit, uh, being based in Queensland and relying heavily on um, the way that Queensland rolls out the protection of airspace within its planning system. Um, but I thought that the term was useful for the purpose of our discussion today. We'll also talk about the protection of airspace regulations and the term navigable airspace. Uh, I've got another question though, and this will be the last one, just so that I understand your understanding about um, what you think the extent of the airspace is for your airport. And what I want to know is what distance of the operational airspace extends for an airport with instrument procedures? I probably should have had another question, or another answer that said don't know. All right, so it looks like some people think maybe five kilometres. A couple have said 15 and most have said 56 kilometres, uh, which is great because that's how far 
the operational airspace extends where you've got instrument procedures in an airport. So well done, everyone. So if I can just go to the next slide, I've just broken some of the definitions down into a small table. In Queensland, the operational airspace is the airspace around a strategic airport, and they're nominally uh, identified within the state planning policy, in which aircraft take off, land or manoeuvre, and for most airports that will be the optical limitation surfaces and the PANS op surfaces, and for defence they have their own um, defence areas control regulations which specify how that airspace is to be protected. For airports applicable to the Airport Act, there's a prescribed airspace, and that calls up OLS or PANS ops and then other airspace that is declared. There's another term that we deal with sometimes in the course of our work, which is the term navigable airspace that CASA uses. It's not defined. Uh, it's borrowed in principle from the FAA. And that talks about airspace above the prescribed minimum altitude of flight. And so CASA, generally speaking, when it's looking at airspace to protect, is thinking about OLS and PANS ops. And it also considers anything that um, projects more than 500 feet above the ground. And in our world, that's normally uh, wind turbines. So there are just some different concepts and understanding of what operational airspace is that we're going to talk about today. Why do we need it? I've just got some photos there. So um, for those of you who are working on airports where you're trying desperately to protect uh, the airspace from penetration by obstacles, it's not unheard of to have an aerodrome that's only one way because it's got very big mountains at one end and around the sides and uh, subject to risk management protocols, aircraft can safely operate to those. But that's not to say we, we allow that within our own regulations. And um, down the bottom you can see a photo there, there's a helicopter and an RJ doing aerial firefighting in amongst a whole bunch of wind turbines. So if you desperately want to, uh, it's, it is safe to operate in and amongst obstacles, but for the purpose of our discussion, we're trying desperately hard to keep obstacles out of our airspace. So we're going to talk about today the difference between the operations under the visual flight rules and instrument of flight rules. And obstacle limitation surfaces are essentially designed for flight under the VFR. And pans off surfaces and the instrument procedures that, that are designed according to those um, rules are for instrument flight. We know about the rules that are in Part 139 and Manual of Standards 139. We know about the Airports Act, and there are other d design rules and inputs to the design based in our regulations and Manual of Standards 173. So here's some images just, just out of interest to try and situate your awareness and consideration of why we're doing this. That's a photo of Brisbane from the top of Mount Cooper in fog. And if I'm going to fly my aeroplane to Brisbane Airport, into a cloud base or um, low fog, then I want to make sure that I'm well separated from obstacles. And in the top right there you can see a diagram that illustrates the obstacle limitation surfaces. And you can see um, there are different parts of the overall OLS that are described and defined for the different types of airports. Other types of um, airspace that are prescribed under the regulations are for example, radar terrain clearance charts, and I've got an example of one of those to show you shortly. Uh, and there are other parts, other surfaces that are not specified as optical limitation surfaces that need to be protected. For example, if you've got precision approach path indicator lights, they have a surface called an optical assessment surface, and there are protection areas around nav aids and other facilities to prevent them from being interfered with as well. So this diagram helps to illustrate, in a way, Optical limitation surfaces are attached to the ground and they're for visual flight. And then pans up surfaces are designed so that you have a minimum separation from optical, so that you have a, a contained area to fly within based on navigational accuracy requirements that provide the appropriate separation vertically from obstacles. Now we know that um, optical limitation surfaces, in a way, are allowed to be penetrated. Uh, because what CASA says is if we put lights on things that penetrate optical limitation surfaces, then they're safe. And the difference between optical limitation surfaces and pans op surfaces is that the pans op surfaces are defined by a vertical buffer from obstacles and are not to be penetrated at all. So if the only thing you take away from today is to remember, OLS is essentially for visual flight and they are defined by the runway environment and pans ops are defined as a vertical uh, separation from obstacles and it's for use under instrument flight so you can fly in cloud and uh, not 
it an obstacle. Um, this is an example of an optical limitation surface diagram and I acknowledge um, one of the persons who helped design this is uh, attending this webinar, so acknowledgement to Cairns Airport for this drawing. And this drawing is the future airspace for Cairns Airport that is protected um, within uh, the Queensland planning framework. And what I wanted to show with this one in particular was the fact that we've documented all of the input data that was used to design these um, drawings. So you can see for each runway, we've defined the runway classification, the, the height that we're designing from, and all of the different design parameters that went towards creating those drawings. And it's, it's a complex set of surfaces that have been integrated together to define the operational airspace of that airport. Now that's um, an international airport with instrument landing system that's basically the most complex optical limitations that uh, you can design. And if I take you to the simplest one that you can have, for those of you who are interested or uh, contemplating the airspace applicable to an aircraft landing area, an ALA, CASA has produced the advisory publication which describes the different types of surfaces applicable to different sized aeroplanes under certain types of operations. And this is the, the base, most basic setup that you can have. So for any uh, aircraft landing area, it's not a regulated aerodrome, but if you uh, intend to provide an aerodrome for the use of aircraft, this is the basic, uh, not a standard, but guidance produced by CASA to help you understand how to provide a safe operating environment. And you can see that the airspace extends out to about 900 metres off each end as an approach and takeoff area. And I've got some diagrams later in the webinar to help illustrate uh, how those surfaces are applied. If we go to fans up surfaces, I've taken this image from Sydney Airport's website, and this is the set of hands up surfaces applicable to the three runways at Sydney Airport. And you can see that there is a very complex set of surfaces, horizontal and sloped, that are designed to enable the safe flight of aircraft in instrument meteorological conditions. And that is about as complex as you're likely to get for hands up surfaces in Australia. The next slide shows a radar terrain clearance chart. It's not a hands up um, product, but it's something that enables air traffic control to use radar or other surveillance means to direct aircraft with a sufficient um, vertical separation of obstacles to maintain a safe flight. So that's what a radar terrain clearance chart looks like. And if we look to military um, airspace, we've got some examples here. Uh, on the left, the green coloured one is Pierce over in Western Australia. And you can see there are two airports there, Pierce and Jinjin, with overlapping optical limitation surfaces. And the way defence works is to identify uh, height above ground based on um, three-dimensional contour data. On the right, top right there, you'll see Townsville, and they've mapped those areas with certain height limitations applicable to the airspace they're protecting there. So that's a very, very, very basic overview. We're not going to go into a lot of detail today, as I said. This is for exposure and to explain the fundamentals. The reason we want to talk about some of these um, ideas is to prevent some of the things that can go wrong. And so I've just borrowed some uh, examples from some of the work that we've been involved with. And here we've got Archer Field. Now this is not uncommon around Australia where uh, incompatible development has caused a runway or a threshold to be relocated or displaced. And what I've shown there is that some light poles situated to the east of the main runway at Archerfield um, prevent the full length of the runway being available for landing because of the minimum gradients to those obstacles. We've got another one. This is an aircraft landing area. This is Mwilumba in northern New South Wales. And you can see there they've got some pilot notes and they're saying that there's a displaced threshold due to industrial buildings and trees at the northern end. And I've circled that, you can see that here, if I use my red pointer, um, these buildings here create an obstacle that have caused the threshold to be displaced by 245 metres. Now this ALA is not protected within the uh, local environment plan for Tweed Shire, 
uh, and unfortunately that displacement is permanent. Uh, from a bigger picture perspective, here's a, another couple of examples. I've just extracted a couple of um, articles from newspapers published online there uh, several years ago now. Parramatta Council was calling for 500 metre high towers to allow the, the city to uh, attract more investment. And ongoing in, in Brisbane at the moment is the discussion for higher buildings in Brisbane CBD, which Brisbane Airport is um, strenuously defending against to protect its airspace. And I'm sure that you will have had similar circumstances in your respective um, areas of interest. This is another one uh, in which I have been involved personally uh, in an expert role where a ferris wheel was placed near the end of a runway at Old Bar in 2011 and an ultralight uh, conducted a touch and go. And you can see in the top right there the aircraft, unfortunately, due to some um, mishandling, but also because of the fact that the Ferris wheel was located at the end of the runway and within the obstacle limitation surfaces applicable to an aircraft landing area, uh, the aircraft ended up impacting the Ferris wheel. Unfortunately, no one was physically injured. And you can see here, I'm just tracing along the shape which defines the airspace that should have been protected from intrusion by obstacles. And it's almost like a perfect storm where the aircraft that was flown impacted the Ferris wheel in the part that was within the, the obstacle limitation surface applicable to that aircraft landing area. We, we don't want that to happen. So now if we just go into some design parameters, these are very high level. I've got some example documents there where we've got the manual of standards part 139 soon to be updated. We've got the CAP 92-1, the purple coloured one, and they describe optical limitation surfaces. And we've also got the, the PANS OPS documents um, with all of their pages and drawings and details about how to design instrument flight procedures safely. So what do we do to establish the operational airspace at a very fundamental level? We need to understand where the runway thresholds and runway ends are because that's where we design optical limitation surfaces from. We need to know their coordinates and elevations. Uh, we also need to know how wide the runway strips are. We need more details if applicable about stopways, clearways, declared distances, uh, and the aerodrome reference point coordinates and elevations, and then any other um, information about navigation aids and facilities on the airport. And that's a lot of detail and often we find that it's not very well recorded or presented. And you can see there an example of a drawing that we're working on with Archfield Airport at the moment in relation to their uh, proposed um, infrastructure modernisation project where we've redesigned some of the thresholds and ends and carefully described where the start of takeoff is, where the threshold is and where all the airspace attaches to the ground on that runway so that we can identify the optical limitation surfaces. And on the top right, that was um, surveying helicopter landing site positions using GPS up in Papua New Guinea. So often we find that this information may be known, or if it is known, sometimes it's not very well recorded. And we very strongly encourage you to keep track of that information and make sure it's presented properly to people to understand and record for the next people in the organisation. I'm going to present some basic concepts now, just for those of you who are not familiar with the idea of uh, optical limitation surfaces, using a simple uh, aircraft landing area and noting that some of the details are different for larger airports. I chose this to illustrate what we're trying to explain because it's the, the most fundamental level for uh, aircraft operations. So these are just some drawings we've prepared to help describe the different parts of the surfaces. And you can see on this drawing, we've got a runway in the middle, and sometimes people call that the strip. The runway strip is the bit outside of the runway, and uh, for an aircraft landing area, there's a flyover area, which for larger, larger airports is incorporated in the overall runway strip. So the runway is the bit that the wheels go on. The runway strip is an area around the sides and the ends for the larger airport, where if the aircraft runs off the runway, it stays up and doesn't suffer damage. And the flyover area is essentially free of vertical obstructions but doesn't need to be able to support an aircraft on the ground. 
And you can see we've identified there where the thresholds are with the two black dots in the middle of the runway at the end where you've got a co-located threshold and end. The next drawing shows an approach and takeoff surface on the runway and then the transitional surface on the sides. And it's like it's a little it's a shape to protect the aircraft from having things penetrating the, the piece of sky that it needs to fly it through when it's taking off or landing. And so you can see uh, in this example we've got co-located approach and takeoff surfaces here, which is an inclined plane that splays slightly, and we'll show some more detail about that shortly. The transitional surface rises up and away from the runway at the sides at a steeper gradient. And then you've got the join from that side back down to the edge of the approach and take off approach surface here. The next slide just shows how to estimate the height of something. And you can see this person is looking at a vertical obstacle. If you stand 45 degrees away from it, then you can tell that it is as high as it is you are away from it, plus or minus your eye height. The next slide shows the three views of the uh, approach and takeoff surfaces and the transitional surface. So with the plan view, you can see if I'm looking down from the top, here's the runway, the runway strip and the flyover area. And you can see this approach and takeoff surface is a, a splayed surface that inclines at a certain angle. And you can see down here, it's this for an ALA, it inclines at 5%. And that's as steep as an approach surface would be. And generally, it's lower than that for the larger airports. And it splays more and, and goes further out. And you can see here, we've got a transitional surface on the sides, which should be free from obstructions. And that inclines at 20% in this case, or 14.3% for the larger airport. The next slide shows how to determine how wide the approach or takeoff surface is at a certain distance out. And that's simply a matter of calculating how far out this obstacle is. And in this case, we've chosen 100 to make it easier. We know that the runway out to the edge of the flyover area is 30 metres in this case. And then because we've progressed 100 metres out at 5%, 5% of 100 is 5 metres. So the overall distance from the centre line is 35 metres. Now the next drawing shows if I've got an obstacle that's a certain height at this location, how do I know how high the surface is? And assuming a flat um, environment from the end of the runway to where the obstacle is, if we're 100 metres out and the approach and takeoff surface inclines at 5%, then we'll have 5 metres from the ground to the surface at that point. And as long as the object is less than 5 metres, then it's not penetrating the surface. One of the other common errors we see, particularly for ALAs, is the, the distances are measured from fence to fence. And clearly, if we've got a fence here, then that's penetrating the surface. And so we say you need to work out high, how high the fence is at your approach gradient, which in this case will be 5%. And that means that the end of the runway is actually 30 metres away from the, the uh, fence. And that means that the actual distances are less than what uh, are published. And in that case, we say that there could be some safety implications. Now this drawing here shows a visual illusion, I guess, because we've drawn those two approach surfaces at the same gradient of 5%. And you can see at the same distance from the end of the runway, on the left-hand side, we can have a much taller obstacle because there is a greater height between the actual ground and the height of the surface, whereas on the Right hand side there, because the terrain rises, we can only have a smaller obstacle here to provide the same piece of airspace for the aircraft to fly to from each end. And finally, one of the other common problems we see in a lot of different ways, and we've used a growth example here, is when the height of a runway is changed. For example, here you can see we've got an exaggerated hump at the end. And if you start measuring the height of the surface from that point, you can see that the tree is underneath the surface here. Whereas after we come in and level that shape, we've lowered the base of the surface and then it becomes penetrated by the tree. So whenever you're changing the runway end elevations or locations, you need to very carefully consider how that affects the obstacle environment near your airport. 
So now we're going to talk about, in general terms, how to protect your operational airspace. And you can see there we've got some images uh, on the top right. We've got um, the operational airspace for an airport called Bundaberg. And every strategic airport in Queensland has that information published on an online system so that people can interrogate those overlays and work out if they are going to penetrate uh, those surfaces. You can see, just as grabbed from Adelaide Airport's website, there's um, discussion about airspace development and crane approval. So to protect their airspace, they publish information and make it easy for crane operators to find out information about how to operate their cranes without impinging on airspace. You can see uh, down the bottom left-hand corner here, this is an example of a letter written by air services to an airport, which describes the pan drop surfaces and the critical obstacles that uh, identify how those surfaces have been defined. And then you can see in the, the left hand side there, someone doing an obstacle survey at an airport, making sure that the obstacle environment hasn't become uh, any worse than it was last time. So annual surveys for those airports subject to regulation. Uh, if you're not subject to regulation, it's still a good idea. Uh, to have a database of the obstacles that you're protecting against, you um, ensure that that information is incorporated in planning processes. Uh, if you're undertaking operational works on an airport, then you're moving a threshold or a runway end or changing something else that affects your obstacle limitation surfaces, then those things need to be carefully considered. Where there's works off airport with cranes or other vertical obstructions, then uh, a good working relationship between the operators and the airport is important and also active monitoring from day to day by looking out when you're doing your inspections around the airport. Now the next couple of slides I just wanted to show you, for those who are not really that aware of the, the scale of how far we need to look to protect our airspace. This is Archerfield Airport and we say commonly that planners um, plan on the basis of a, a property boundary. So we've shown here this is the size of the the airport and the boundaries that would normally be considered in a, in a planning sense. Uh, and then what we say is there's 15 kilometres and that's the furthest extent that an optical limitation surface would extend, particularly on the runway alignment for the approach and takeoff surfaces. And then where an airport has procedures for instrument flight, then we're looking 55.6 kilometres and that surprises people sometimes to show how far you need to look to, to check obstacles. So 55.6 kilometres or 30 nautical miles is the number to remember. Finally, some complications. Um, and these are just to put out there to say the standards are the standards, but unfortunately sometimes they're hard to apply in certain circumstances. Where there's a non-standard runway strip width or a non-standard aircraft code number or um, the reference elevation datum is unknown where the thresholds and ends aren't coincident. If a runway slopes or if there's an ILS at one end or if the one-way runway, particularly in Papua New Guinea and Indonesia, for example, um, where an obstacle is non-negotiable and it has to stay there, how do we treat that? And sometimes we see distances calculated from the wrong location. And that's why we say it's important to make sure that you understand the information you need to design and protect your airspace. Um, I've got some questions here, so we'll just answer that one. What is the web address to access the Queensland Airport airspace charts? It is, if you Google SPP interactive mapping, that will take you to that um, resource. So SPP interactive mapping. Now the only other thing I've got to do is just summarise and then take any questions that might be at the end there. So what I'd say is, as a very, at the fundamental perspective of protecting your airspace, you need to start with a design aircraft and scope of operations. That's the first question we ask. If, if we're working on a new airport or putting some airspace together or if we're understanding how to protect airspace where we're considering potential penetrations, we need to know what are the aircraft that are flying there and what are they doing? We under, need to understand all the input parameters. So what is the threshold location? What is the elevation of the threshold? How wide is the runway strip? and then they are the, the inputs to the further analysis and design work. Once you've worked out what your operational airspace is, 
then make sure it's established and protected through planning schemes or planning systems and other mechanisms uh, and make sure that you have good working relationship with planners and those people that commonly um, could penetrate your airspace and then make sure any complications are resolved. And that takes us to the end of the presentation uh, other than to say that's the scope of what we discussed at a, at a very basic level and uh, are there any other questions? I've only got one there. Yep, great to have this information accessible for all levels of stakeholders. And there was a question about the SPP interactive mapping in Queensland. So that was all I had to say. As I said, it was only a very interactive mapping in Queensland. So that was all I had to say. As I said, it was only a very basic introduction to the space and some of the considerations we had. Uh, thanks, Keith. Um, just while I'm closing off, if, if anyone does think of anything, do jump in. But um, I'll just take the opportunity to, to again um, thank you, um, Keith, and, and thank you to Aviation Projects for your support um, of this webinar, but not only this webinar, but just across uh, uh, multiple events, including division meetings over the, over the recent period is included. Um, so um, we wouldn't be able to present these sorts of um, uh, events without um, your support. So thank you. Um, uh, and thank you to everybody um, also, um, actually sorry, I think there is a question that's popped in before I do close off there, Keith. Um, so there was one question about should the OAS, the Obstacle Assessment Service, be surveyed annually? Yes, it should be. Yeah, that was a nice easy one. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so thank you also to everybody for participating today. I hope uh, um, you managed, uh, everybody got um, some valuable insight out of um, today's session. As Keith described, it was really a fundamentals um, uh, a session. But if you if you do have any specific um, questions, I'd, I'd, um, I'd encourage you to contact either the AAA or or, or um, Keith directly. His details are there on the screen as we speak. Uh, there is a uh, short survey uh, on the screen on the right hand side there for everybody. I would encourage you to jump in and, and provide some feedback that helps us with our future webinars uh, in terms of improving things over time. Um, and uh, just so everybody is aware, this webinar will be recorded and it will be uh, available on our YouTube channel uh, on YouTube. So just look up Australian Airports Association in YouTube and you'll be able to find us there. Um, and, uh, and an email will be sent around post-event uh, as well directly from our, um, web, uh, from our conferencing company, Redback. Uh, teleconferencing. So, um, and just a final plug uh, for the AAA uh, national conference is coming up in November in Adelaide. Um, the pro full program has now been released and is available on our website, which is uh, our conference website, I should say, airportsconference.asn.au. Uh, and uh, just uh, for those regional airports that may be on the phone, um, we do have a regional um, scholarship program this year. Um, so. Um, we have had some information in Airport Alert that's gone around about that, but if you do need any more information on the uh, regional scholarship program, or equally if you are uh, would be keen in, in supporting uh, and being a sponsor of a, a particular um, uh, airport to come to um, to the national conference, we'd encourage you to also reach out. So events at airports.asn.au is the email address there. Um, and finally, um, our next webinar is the uh, is a webinar on MOS 139 notice of proposed rulemaking um, consultation that's ongoing at the moment. So the NPRM has been released. Um, it's out um, for consultation and uh, submissions for that are due in December. So um, we are sort of we are participating and going through a progress uh, process at the moment, of helping consolidate um, a submission on behalf of our members. So um, please do reach out to the AAA if you want any more information on that. But a webinar will be held on the 11th of October to uh, provide a bit more information to members as well. So again, thanks to everybody, and thank you, Keith, and uh, have a have a lovely day.